Here you have a recipe for a two-tiered society of the poor who live on universal basic income and nothing else, who are stuck with a hobby existence, a kind of eternal retirement existence, as opposed to an engagement in the exercise of social freedom. And then you have a very sizable cost to all of this. By contrast, if you have guaranteed jobs through what in the American context can be spoken of as a federal job guarantee, because... Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. I got a lot of feedback on last week's episode. Quite a few people said that they really enjoyed this and found it valuable. And a few more people mentioned in comments and shares that they just thought that was a really good discussion. So thank you for the feedback. That's great. And if you haven't already, uh, you can check that out. Utilitarianism with uh, Professor Roger Crisp from Oxford. That's on the site, politicalphilosophypodcast.com, under the episodes section. So, today's guest is philosophy professor Richard Winfield. Professor Winfield is at the University of Georgia. His research interests are ethics, philosophy of mind, metaphysics, epistemology, aesthetics, the philosophy of nature, and Hegel. And he's the author of a number of books on Hegel, including Hegel and the Future of Systematic Philosophy, Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel's Science of Logic, and Hegel in Mind. He's also the author of A Just State, Rethinking Self-Government, where he develops many of the political views that we discuss today. He's also a congressional candidate in Georgia's 10th district, and he's running on those political views. And at the heart of his platform is the idea of a federally guaranteed job, which is his solution to the problems of um, inequality and poverty in American life, in contrast to a universal basic income. And this is a discussion, together with reading his work, that actually convinced me. I think I'd somewhat lazily fallen into the idea of a universal basic income without really being critical about everything that that would entail. And hearing Professor Winfield's arguments, I've become convinced that a federally guaranteed job, at least if done correctly, would actually be a much better solution. So... Judge for yourselves whether or not you too find this convincing. Um, I will mention that for about the first half of the interview, we talk philosophy and we talk about can philosophy have ultimate foundations or not, with me arguing that it can and Professor Winfield arguing that it can't. If you want to get straight to the political part, that's about halfway in. One final note is... I've just invested in um, a bunch more recording equipment. I've got a fancy new microphone and stuff like that. This is because there have been a couple of episodes where the audio quality was less than perfect. This was one of them, unfortunately. There was a little bit of crackle at some points in the recording. I've spent the last few hours doing my very, very best to get rid of it. I think I got rid of about 85%, but particularly at the very beginning and the very end and a couple of moments where we're both talking together, there's a little bit of crackle in the background. For the most part, the interview's fine, and I've done my best with it. But for the moments it does come in, it is a bit annoying, so sorry about that. Um, Going forward, like I say, I've invested in a bunch of new equipment, so this shouldn't be an issue. And even with a few audio hiccups, this is just a really interesting conversation and a really pertinent one. So, without further preamble, it is my pleasure to present Professor Richard Winfield. I'm 
I'm here today with Hegel professor and congressional candidate, Professor Richard Winfield. Professor, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, but I'd rather not be called a Hegel professor. I ah. be inspired by Hegel, but I'm trying to work out things systematically in my own right and go beyond what he achieved. But Let's... that's, uh, one gets tagged with that term, and of course it's dismissed by most people as something outside the canon of proper philosophy in our current academic uh, environment. Do you but think and that's, uh, Do you think Hegel's no longer seen as respectable? I, I view him only as quite an intimidating read, and I, I didn't mean anything as to his validity. Well, I, I mean, I think he's not really part of the canon for most of academic philosophy. At most, you might have one token person doing work on Hegel, and usually they're informed by philosophical trends, either um, analytic philosophy, Kantian philosophy, postmodern philosophy, which make use of Hegel, I think, for ends that really show that they're, they're really not recognizing what is fundamentally uh, revolutionary about him, that he wants to do philosophy without foundations and yet be systematic. Um, we're going to get to your congressional run and all sure. that in a sec, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued because I studied Hegel because I wanted to understand Marx. Yes. Um, which I, I think... Hegel have done that, of course. Which, which is, yeah, which is not to say I understand it. I quite manifestly didn't. So what, what, is, what is Hegel's... Could you cash out the last thing you said, a philosophy without foundations? What, what yeah. briefly does that mean? And then we'll get to the other stuff. I mean, essentially, it, it, it recognizes that, uh, you know, philosophy cannot operate by presupposing either the character of its subject matter or the nature of its method. If it operates with those assumptions, then everything it does is relative to whatever either uh, givens pertaining to subject matter or method are presupposed at the outset. And I think all philosophers have attempted in one way or another to set them free of all dogmas, to question the given in all respects. But in doing so, they've often made appeal to some privileged factor that they have taken to be presuppositionless or that on which everything else rests. So you see much classical philosophy making appeal to that which is primordial in nature, the first principle, it could mm. be a first principle of being. Then when, uh, you know, the recognition sets in that uh, any claims about what is first and in, their, in that sense immediate rather than mediated by anything else, uh, one recognizes that to some degree uh, any claims about what is immediate or fundamental or ultimate uh, is a claim that is being made using a, a, a knowing whose authority is taken for granted. So then you have something akin to the Kantian term or the transcendental term, which wants to argue that uh, philosophy cannot begin with any claims about the given, about what is. It must first uh, investigate the authority of its own knowing. And Hegel, as you know, will, will speak about um, any knowing that regards knowing as being fundamentally about something different from itself as always being burdened by... But aren't there some things which are both conferrers of normativity and sources of it? So, I generally take an ethically consequentialist view. Isn't something just like sensations within consciousness? Um, we, we, it's sort of like, I think, therefore I am. We know that there's sources of value within our own mind. And well, on what basis, you, on well, what basis on, do right. that? And, 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 and there is, and, and hang on, hang on, hang on, and, and you're quite right, there is no external, if I say happy, let's just go very basic utilitarian, happiness is valuable and suffering isn't, and you say, well, on what basis do you make that distinction? There's nothing outside of your own consciousness on which you can rest that distinction. It's just, it, it's, it's like there's certain axioms in mathematics that you can't prove without being questioned begging, but... Well, so you have to... You have to flee your own consciousness, or flee your own body, or flee the world and the determinate culture in which you operate, in order to get at what is not conditioned, what is not relative. Because it, it makes no sense whatsoever to claim 
that any of the enabling conditions of our discourse determine what we take to be valid, what we take to be true. Because well, in that case, it, we, these enabling conditions, which make it possible for us to think, after all, I can't think, we can't engage in philosophy. If there is not a nature that has a certain character which allows life to emerge, and allow, right, allows right. a certain I kind didn't... of life to emerge, and then allows individuals to have a, um, an, you could say, a semiotic imagination which allows them to have language and so forth. But if you take any of these factors, without which we can't think, to be determinative of what distinguishes true from false thinking or right from wrong action, then you fall into these problems of foundational justification. Well, no, 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 hang on, hang on. Um, I didn't, when, when I said that just sort of consciousness could be a source, just a foundational source of normativity, I didn't say it was the only one. There's clearly true well, claims. Think it, can't be a, it can't be a foundation. It cannot be a juridical foundation. Normativity in general cannot have juridical foundations. Conduct can have enabling conditions. But these enabling conditions are the conditions of both right and wrong conduct, true and false theorizing, and must be. Because if any factor of this sort were to be ascribed the juridical character of determining what counts as true or false, we turn to investigate the knowing of what is, as if we first had to certify the ability of that knowing, that cognition. But in doing so, we can't help but make immediate claims about it from a knowing that is different from the knowing we are investigating. The knowing we're investigating is a knowing of objects. But our transcendental investigation is the knowing of the knowing of objects. We are engaged in a knowing of knowing. We do not and cannot put under scrutiny our transcendental cognition. It operates completely dogmatically. And it can't help but do so. Because here... The knowing that is under investigation is in principle different from the knowing that carries on the investigation. How do you deal with the philosophic skeptic or the, um, the, the moral relativist? So just based on some of the stuff of yours that I've read, you want to make moral claims about the world, and we'll get into some of them. But what, 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 if I just keep asking you why... You know, so so you might say um, people have a right to be guaranteed a job by the government, and we can get into that. And I say, okay, in virtue of what do they have that right? What, if I keep asking why, where do you get to a point where you just sort of say, well, because X, and the buck stops here? And now, by the way, the whole question of why is ordinarily raised to look for something different from what you're asking why about. You're, in other words, looking for some reason that is to justify what it is you are investigating. You're presuming the whole framework of foundational justification in the way that question is typically asked. Yes. And, and, and the skeptic, and I think the classical skeptics like sexist and empiric, do this in, in, in the most uh, powerful way. And they call into question any appeal to criterion of any sort, recognizing that the moment you appeal to any foundation, one faces a dilemma of how do you justify the legitimacy and exclusive authority of that foundation? It seems on its own terms you have to appeal to some other foundation to base it. Do you not? I, 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 in, in, in I, I can't process. quite let go of the idea that there are some foundations that are self-justifying. So what about something like logical, this isn't normative, but something like logical discreteness, the idea that they can be two separate things. So from that you get 2 plus 2 equals 4, you get the basic laws of um, addition, subtraction, and then you can add, from them you can derive multiplication, division, but it all just... Yeah, I mean, you raise the question of determinacy. No foundational discourse can provide us with an understanding of determinacy or what it is to be determinate, because their whole enterprise makes use from the outset with some privilege given of some sort that is the foundation. It's only if you engage in a discourse that takes nothing for granted that you can give an account of what it is to be determinate. And you can't give an account of what it is to be determinate by invoking any determinate factors because you're just operating in circles. You can only provide an account of what is determinate by starting with what is indeterminate. And by the way, that's how Hegel's logic proceeds. But if we now turn to questions of, of let's say, ethics, and one begins with this understanding that Ethics is really the theory of the reality of self-determination. 
And when recognizes that self-determination is different from the choosing will, which is, in a sense, the characterization, or I should say mischaracterization, that freedom is given by classical liberal theory that informs our constitutional framework, there freedom is thought of as, in effect, the choosing will that is a function of the self. The choosing will is not self-determined in two respects. First of all, it is the underlying psychological condition of any, any volition. It is not a product of volition. In that regard, it is not artificial, it is natural. And it is not determined by willing. It is the presupposition of any act of willing. Moreover, because it's the presupposition of any act of willing, no matter what is willed, choices involved, it is formal. And because it's formal, that means that the content of what the choosing will wills is not determined by its own structure. It has to find the options from somewhere else. So, so the reason. question, does that distinction between yeah. two types of freedom you just made, does that bleed forward into your criticism of universal basic income and your support for a guaranteed job scheme? I, well, I thought I detected well, a shadow of it in yeah. that. I mean, in a sense, if you, if you follow out the, the kind of um, ethics that starts with the choosing will or liberty, mm. and I'm talking about social contract theory, or um, you, might, you might say procedural justice in general, or a form of willing, and note, a, form of, a type of willing that is formal in character, is regarded as the foundation of justification. That ends up typically with a framework within which freedom gets reduced to property right, and the administration of law that upholds property right. But you can have self-determination when the agency is itself a product of willing. The agency that is self-determined has to be a conventional agency. And we find that in the structures of right. And to give you the examples we're all familiar with, we determine ourselves to be an owner by interacting with others, by laying our will in a recognizable way in in external factors that in some respect conform or do not conflict with where other agents who we're interacting with lay claim to the objectivity of their will and thereby determine themselves as owner. Or to speak of it in the most global sense, we are citizens insofar as we participate in an institution of self-government. And that institution of self-government consists in nothing other than our activities as citizens. It has no independent existence. So here we're talking about types of agency that have their being through certain forms of interrelated willings or volitions that have to be willed in connection to one another. So that, for example, when I exercise my political freedom and determine myself as a citizen, I'm engaging in activities that do not in any way prevent others from doing the same. That's equally true with property rights. When I exercise my property rights, I'm not doing anything that if I'm within the boundary of my rights, is in any way undermining the rights of others. So you've given a framework for how we get to property rights, um, political autonomy, stuff like that. And you said, I might be misparaphrasing you, but you said what makes it make sense is if I'm claiming property rights by owning, by having, by whatever, that doesn't conflict no, with anyone. Yeah. But that doesn't conflict with anyone else's ability to do the same. But, but rights claims are always in conflict all the time, and often a zero-sum conflict. So claims to property rights are often in a zero-sum conflict with claims to welfare rights. I have a right to health care, I have a right to food. Be, wrong, it can't be in a zero-sum claim, because although the structures of freedom do not have normative foundations, you cannot exercise any right unless you are recognized to be owner of your own body. That is a precondition of having any claims regarding welfare. Otherwise, you're a slave and your master is in complete control of you. Now, admittedly, property rights are subject to various kinds of modifications in order for them to conform with other kinds of self-determinations. If you look at classical liberal theory, there's all this, always this problem of how do we ensure that civil government that has been erected by, in effect, an exercise of property right, namely contract, is going to actually do what it's supposed to do 
and what gives it its legitimating mission, namely uphold property rights. It's recognized it might not. And the reason it might not, it, it is something that's instrumental in character. It has its validity only as an instrument for upholding something separate from itself. Put this in a, a really concrete case, because maybe I'm just still not getting this. Yeah. Say I've got two people in front of me, and they're both giving me claims that are not compatible with each other, but all they're giving me to back up those claims is the idea of an abstract right. It's almost like I've got a Muslim and a Christian trying to convert me, and all they've got is faith, but they, 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 it's an equally valid claim. So just to concretize it, I have a libertarian in front of me who says, you cannot tax my income because I have property rights, and we all agree money shouldn't be stolen off. And I say, well, that sounds good. And then I have a socialist in front of me who says, we all should be provided with health care because we have a right to our lives, even if that means we have to tax the income of the libertarian. And I say, well, that sounds good. But the enforcement of those two rights would either we're going to tax someone's income or we're not. And to do so would violate one of those rights claims. And both rights claims are valid as far as they go. I think people do have a right to their life. I think people do have a right to their property. But there comes practical moments where one's going to have to give way or they're going to have to compromise. Well, I, I, think, I think you're wrong that there's, there's a fundamental conflict in the sense that one has to be given up. The right to property is not something that can ever be completely eliminated because unless, as I said, individuals recognize each other as owners of at least their own body, they can't be recognized to have any further entitlements. But that doesn't mean that property itself cannot depend, up for its very own realization, cannot depend upon certain kinds of limitations without which its own reality cannot be upheld. Now, if you take owners by themselves and the interaction that owners involve, engage in mm. and determine themselves as owners which essentially involves a kind of reciprocal recognition. Right. Where we recognize our respective, shall we say, externalizations of our will as owners in factors that are to be exclusively our own domain. Admittedly, they're, 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 the fact that the participants have choosing wills allows for two kinds of wrongs. One is a malicious wrong, where an individual simply chooses to ignore the entitlements of others and does so knowingly. In that case, they're committing a crime. And property, the near context of property owners itself is not capable of adjudicating that situation because no one has any authoritative role to play uh, in terms of really um, assuring what counts as the domain of one person as opposed to another, or exactly what the punishment be, and so forth. You can also have non-malicious conflicts where we in good faith disagree over what are the boundaries. If rights claims their validity, their assessment, are sort of arising out of a, a universal consent, a universal recognition. How do we deal with a world when, in which, in reality, there are profound ideological differences? So just, I'll simplify it, but say in America, you've got two halves of the country, one of which has a much more expansive and hard line understanding of what property rights is, and another has an understanding that's much more limited and much more able to to make other rights claims, you know, work with those I, property I think, claims, I yeah, then, yeah. then it seems like the idea of, um, so, so I'm reminded of Locke saying money exists through universal consent, which if you have a fiat currency, surely it does. But if rights exist, through a sort of universal recognition, then what do you do when there isn't a universal recognition, when you have two camps or three or four or whatever that have radically different and incompatible views of the rights claims? Well, this, you know, we have to consider how extreme the dispute is. Obviously, if, if, it's, if it's completely extreme, as in the conflict between those who uphold self-determination, as that in which normativity resides, and fascists who regard normativity to reside in particular givens, residing in a certain kind of ethnic identity or a racial identity, or alternately in a religious fundamentalism that regards 
theological law. And those, like, oh, and those views aren't completely as, non-absent in American life. True, but, you know, I wouldn't say they have a dominant role, but they're there. But obviously then we're dealing with a situation that uh, may not be resolvable through the workings of uh, an existing framework of uh, institutions of right. So what do we do then? But, but, when you, but when you think about the divide within the United States, well, it may require warfare, revolution, whatever. But, but, no, but, but what do we do on a normative level? What do we do to stand to say if we had to go to war to defeat fascism? Well, we may have then, to go then, to war to but, 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 but what would make that war, war, what, well, but what would make that war right or just if by saying right or just are things that are arrived at by a universal understanding? It, it, there clearly isn't a universal understanding when we go... Once again, you're thinking in foundational terms. Yeah, it, yeah, I'm, I'm a diehard analytic philosopher. You're going to... Gonna... Whatever it, it arrives at, as if that were indeterminate, uh, is what counts. Here it's the very, the very reality of right. It has a determinate character. And part of that determinate character involves recognizing that the institutions of political freedom cannot operate unless citizens at the same time have their household and social rights recognized and enforced. And that is something that is not fully recognized in the United States Constitution, which says almost nothing about the family or social and economic rights. In some reflect, in sense, it reflects that very truncated vision of freedom, which the liberal tradition that informed the thinkers of the founders laid claim to, this idea of freedom understood as liberty. You can contrast the United States Constitution with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which, by the way, was drawn up under a committee presided over by Eleanor Roosevelt, who, in a sense, put in it the kind of rights that FDR spoke of in 1944 in his last State of the Union message, where he, he made a famous speech, which has been still largely ignored, in which he said, look, the American Constitution is not sufficient to provide for our freedom in the modern world. We need a new Bill of Rights. And among the rights that we now have to recognize and enforce, which are not explicitly stated in the Constitution, are the right to have a job, to have a livelihood that's sufficient to support our families. We have to have a right to health care. We have to have a right to education at all levels, a right to culture, a right to decent housing, and so forth. Those rights are not specified in the American Constitution. There is a divide, as you know, within the American population, as in many other countries, between those who subscribe to a very narrow view of freedom, who want to say property rights come first, they also regard the workings of the market as equivalent to the realization of property rights, which I, I think they're not. There's something more involved, which we can talk about later. And then they want to say, well, the state should basically take a laissez-faire attitude. We should have a kind of minimal state, right? And, and basically, we can have um, measures that ensure that the monopolies are broken up and we can ensure that people don't starve. But beyond that... Uh, government should not go. On the other hand, we have this other view, which I think can be argued for philosophically and practically, that, you know, our democracy cannot function unless people are able to have economic autonomy and also um, autonomy within the household, which so, means a hierarchical, natural, um, I should say natural, the hierarchical, traditional structures of family, which depend upon natural differences between men and women and heterosexuality are not allowed to be determinative of household co-determination. And then also we have to think of a society in which people can actually exercise their autonomy. And that takes us back to the issue of universal basic income. There's a whole bunch I want to say about what you just said, but I think we should move on to what we are met here to discuss, yeah, yeah. which is, so I'm sort of of a far left tradition in American politics. And when you get to these questions, most far lefties want to, their, their sort of stock answer is, I think raising the minimum wage, I don't disagree, but I think it's insufficient. And I think most people, when they get to that point, will say something along the lines of universal basic income. You're rejecting that. Why don't you real quick just talk me through your rejection of universal basic income? I mean, universal basic income is... is put forward, by the way, not just by the left, but by right-wing people, like Milton yes, Friedman and others, correct. 
um, who feel that this is a way of eliminating all welfare dependency and so forth. Uh, Nixon, to some degree, supported it. But it's presented as if it is a way of eliminating poverty and in some way confronting the fact that the full-time job is under assault from automation as well as from the gig economy. And we have to deal with that. Well, how do we deal with it according to universal basic income? We give everyone a certain income which is basic in the sense that it will provide them with, in a sense, the means of living. And it's recognizing it can't be much higher than that for two reasons. First of all, there is an understanding that one has to retain some incentive for some people to work and produce wealth because their activities are going to support the universal basic income of everyone. And that means there has to be a very sizable difference between what people will earn who do work and those who just have universal basic income. So that means we have a very two-tiered society under universal basic income. We have those who have only universal basic income and those who have both universal basic income and are engaged in the production of wealth and receiving income that allows them to do the same. Now, the other side of it is, 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 is there's a presumption that universal basic income is, is, is a liberation. And it's a liberation that people think of very much in the ways in which the young Marx spoke about uh, emancipation. You know, you write poetry in the evening, you go painting in the afternoon, you read philosophy at night, etc. You engage in all these hobby activities, these private activities. Why? Because you don't have the resources to do much else. I mean, think of what you can do in various workplaces. Think of the various resources you have at your disposal. Think, on the other hand, of what you can do if all you have is your universal basic income and your time. And I, I think it's, it's not only very limited. It's a way, again, of thinking about freedom in purely libertarian or liberal terms, because it involves not being able to participate in economic self-determination, let alone anything else. We're not talking about engaging in politics or anything of that sort. But it's also demoralizing. And it's demoralizing because in ways that I think are exhibited often by welfare dep dependency. I mean, it, what you have in, in nations, for example, in Northern Europe, that have a much bigger safety net than the United States and a, and a more extensive one, they don't have guaranteed jobs, but they will leave people on unemployment insurance for a long time. But that is not a very happy state to be in. And you have a lot of discontent and a lot of hatred of immigrants on the part of those who either don't have a job but are being cared for, have access to free health care, universities, etc. Um, but also the other side, I think you may be familiar with Spielenham, the Spielenham experiment. It's so, something Napoleone describes. Yeah, it took so, place in England at the time yeah, yeah. when the Industrial Revolution was beginning to get underway. The countryside was becoming pauperized as the traditional forms of peasant life were being disrupted. And you had a decision in the region of Spielenham to come up with a universal basic income. It was tied to the price of bread. Basically, everyone, whether they worked or not, would be given this. Well, it led to a complete breakdown of the society. I mean, people ran amok. Labor discipline disappeared. And on the other hand, the employers took advantage of this. They all lowered their wages by the amount of this universal basic income, because they reason, why do we have to pay them more than the universal basic income? Let's reduce our wages, and the universal basic income will make up the difference. So it ended up being a subsidy to employers, and then it was removed after a certain number of years. So the situation is very different. So, so in a way, here you, you, here you have a recipe for a two-tiered society of the poor who live on universal basic income and nothing else, who are stuck with a hobby existence, a kind of eternal retirement existence, as opposed to an engagement in the exercise of social freedom. And then you have a very sizable cost to all of this. By contrast, if you have guaranteed jobs through what in the American context can be spoken of as a federal job guarantee, because if, if it's really going to be something- I, I have, I have one question federal. before we go to your jobs okay. proposal. Sure. Sure. Um, and this is more a matter of political language and political yeah. strategy, but I'm curious what you think of it. Is I hear a lot a narrative from the Bernie Sanders left, which yeah. essentially sort of amounts to, you know, our political vision is that we become Sweden. 
and that yeah. they'll say America is sort of, their narrative is essentially America is the worst industrialized country in the world because of our poverty rates, our lack of um, uh, uh, universal health care, our lack of a social safety net, which is all true. But then their vision for that is, well, if we were just like the Nordic countries, and they continually, again, correctly point to stats from Sweden, Denmark, Norway, whatever, showing yeah. much higher equality, much less poverty, yeah. whatever. I've always found that narrative profoundly uninspiring. I don't disagree with the statistics yeah. that they cite, yeah. but it seems like really our big hope for the greatest, most powerful country in the world is that we become Denmark. Like, and I think most Americans find it uninspiring. I mean, I'm proposing something that, by the way, was put into effect on a mass scale in the United States mm. in the 30s under FDR, under the Works Progress Administration, the Civil Conservation Corps, the Federal Writers Project, etc., where eight and a half million people were put to work directly by the government. Um, who were jobless. That was during the Great Depression. We had 25% unemployment. Right. Do you not think there's something just in terms of perception that just yeah. feels more American about what you're saying? What you're saying is you have a well, right to a job, and Americans well, hate the well, idea of handouts. You're saying, right. I can see what you're saying working with red state voters. Right. You have the right, you're not saying you have the right to live off the government. You're saying you have the right to work. Exactly. I mean, if, if, you, if you're disabled, truly disabled, fine. You deserve support. If you can no longer work, you deserve support. And not a universal basic income. You deserve the equivalent of a fair minimum wage. Uh, and I can discuss what that is in a moment. But here we're talking about a measure that has not been followed in the social democratic countries of Europe. They have not provided guaranteed jobs. And I think that's one of their big failures. And I think it's a part of the social malaise that is, that is leading to the rise of these, these far-right parties. But I, but I think it's something that deals with the problem of poverty in a way that does not put people in a situation where we divide society between those on the dole and those who are not. Everyone is given an opportunity to support themselves if they can do so, which is to say it is something in tune with the so-called American dream. It's in tune with thinking about uh, what should be the goal of, of public intervention. It, the goal should be to make people independent, not dependent. And to allow them to, to earn on their own. And of course, if you, you know, people will ask, well, what happens if someone gets one of these jobs and they don't do the work? Well, then they don't get paid. They're not going to be paid unless they do the work. And if you can work, but you don't work, don't expect anything. You, in a sense, have a social obligation to participate so in our social wheel. I have one more question about Europe, just because that's where yeah. I'm from. So there's a right-wing narrative, which I've yeah. never been able to wholly dismiss, that Europe right now is sort of lost in a sort of collective meaninglessness. We no longer, we're increasingly secular, we no longer have the traditional forms of religion. But then yeah. when you see something like Brexit, it becomes overwhelmingly clear, whatever the merits of that decision, that people just weren't invested in the European Union at the level of belief. They're not invested in their own societies at their level of belief. And there's this sort of conservative idea that there's no collective meaning anymore. And you hear it a lot. Do you think if they'd have gone, if Europe had gone down your road instead of like just trying to provide a high welfare net, that might have been alleviated to some degree? I mean, to some degree, I mean, the other side of it, which I think distinguishes America from Europe, is we are not a nation state. The, the states in Europe, by and large, retain, let's say, national identities that are tied to a, an ethnic identity, a linguistic identity, a cultural identity. The United States is not of that character, despite the fact that in its history, a certain ethnic group, namely white Anglo-Saxons, has at various periods attempted to assert its dominance, but that has been recognized not to be the nature of our polity. Our polity is one in which there is no ethnic identity for what it is to be American. We are not necessarily melting pot, but we contain people, obviously, from every single nation in the world. And they are fellow citizens, not because they share language, not because they share ethnicity, not because they share religion, but because in some respect, they recognize the authority of a constitution which is devoted in principle to, to freedom and self-determination. And that's the source of meaning. Now, obviously, 
There are those who want to return to the nation state model, or one might even say the fascist model, who want to think of America yes. as a white Christian nation. Trump encourages them, of course. And I think you find that, well, in Brexit in a, in a way, um, it, it has an anti-immigrant character, which is tied to the open borders of the you know, European Union. Most definitely. And the European Union, first of all, was not, was not a proper nation, right? It, it, it put all the nations under certain kind of joint economic stewardship, which in many respects put them under the control of the dominant economic powers. Without ever German. asking people or giving them a reason to believe in it, without ever inspiring them. And in not that. really becoming a, 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 a genuine, let's say, federal government. Um, in other words, the nations that belong to the EU are not like the states in the American Union. Admittedly, it, to begin with, after independence, we, we were a confederacy, which might even be thought of as more like the European Union, except that the states did not have different ethnic identities. But they were more like independent states. The national government had very little power. It, it was recognized we needed a so, more perfect so union. You've been, I've seen videos of you canvassing your district, um, no. which is something I've done a lot of. Political canvassing can be fun, can be grueling, can be whatever. So what is the reaction of like conservative voters who voted for Trump last time round to the idea of a federally guaranteed job? How does that go down on the doorstep? Now, first of all, I have to say that I am in a primary race. Right. We have the primary system where instead of a parliamentary system where you could say the party determines who will run and it has, has a lot of control over the program that people will run on. Here, it's up to the candidate to determine. True, what but you, even then, you and, must, there must but, be some conservative yeah. Democrats that you talk to. No, but, no but, but well, it turns out that Democrats in Georgia, like much of the South, are overwhelmingly African-American and relatively impoverished by and large. And they uniformly respond very positively to the economic rights I'm putting forward. Now, I have had a few occasions to speak to audiences that involved whites who are not liberals, part of the Athens liberal university community, but uh, in trade unions, because I, I, I am a trade union member. I'm a member of a union that is part of the Communication Workers of America that's trying to organize all employees at University of Georgia. So I've also been speaking at various union meetings, and some of them, as was the case with a steelworkers meeting, small steelworkers meeting in a little town called Winder, um, not making steel, they make fiberglass. Um, but half of the people there were whites, and I do not think they are Democrats. But they, I think they recognize the value of guaranteed jobs, of fair wages, and of employee empowerment. After all, they're union members. Of course, they're a small minority because of that. They're not exactly the average. But politically speaking, I suspect many of them voted for Trump. But they're very responsive to these economic issues. I mean, after all, Trump was offering his own solution to their economic woes. So I think if we can give them the real solutions, it's possible to get through to them. One final question. I'm really addressing that audience. Hmm. In, in any great degree until I win the primary. But if, if you do win the primary, you will be, right? Exactly. Exactly. Then I have to. I don't have to win over all of them or a majority. Hmm. I just have to win about a third and have a strong Democratic turnout. On the Democratic side, one final question on applied politics is yeah. what do you think a universally guaranteed right to work would do to race relations in this country. I mean, there's, all, there's an income gap between black and white Americans, yeah, yeah. but even more starkly, there's a wealth gap. The wealth gap is something like $100,000. It's just, it's just yeah, crazy. Yeah. How would this work vis-a-vis, -vis, say, universal basic income or simply just raising the minimum wage by itself? Well, first of all, universal basic income, as I've, as I've tried to argue, keeps a divide between the poor and everyone else between those who are dependent and on the dole and those who are not. Um, and they would be disproportionately people who are currently poor, which would be disproportionately Hispanics, African Americans, Native Americans. So I think, how do we eliminate the disparity in unemployment rates between black and white? Black suffer ha twice the unemployment levels. Well, we eliminate unemployment with guaranteed jobs. How do we eliminate the divide in income, well, we raise the bottom 
to $20 an hour. That's what I'm proposing as a fair minimum wage. It reflects not just inflation, but productivity gains. And, and keep in mind, in the United States, income rose pretty much in tandem with productivity gains from 45 to 73. So most people had an increasing standard of living. Then, then, then it declined, and we've been becoming more and more um, uh, unequal. So I think that will have a major impact in changing the life circumstances. I don't think wealth need be the, the determining factor of one's opportunity. Because even if you look at what the average white family has, it's not, a mu it's not much. It's not enough to really provide them security. It's really income that is, that is the real source. And wealth is very unevenly distributed among whites as among everyone else. So I think if we have single payer health care with no copays, no deductibles, we have free higher education with stipends for so you can live while you're a student. If we have a legal care system where everyone can go to any lawyer they want for civil and criminal cases, have it paid by progressive taxation, we can make differences in wealth much less determinative of one's opportunities. And then and that way one can eliminate the importance of that disparity. And then final question, what would yeah. you what would you have these people doing? So you're saying instead of providing a high welfare net, we're going to spend a lot of money to pay people $20 an hour to do what exactly? Anything that the community needs. Not just infrastructure, but a green infrastructure, public transportation, which is sadly wanting in our place, upgrading poor housing, building affordable housing, providing human services, child care, elder care, teaching philosophy in schools. At putting artists at work, putting dramatists at work. I mean, under the New Deal, with the Federal Writers Project, Arts Project, there were hundreds of thousands of performances. There's a cultural desert out in much of these places. There's nothing for people to avail themselves of. They don't even have broadband. So we can put people to work of all different skills, of all different aptitudes, and provide the kind of things that the market is not making available. So, so it's not just a matter of, of digging ditches. It's, it's a matter of doing things of... Because uh, there, is, there is the Keynesian element. That's Kate Keynes, isn't it? He says you can just have them dig pots of money out the ground. But what you're saying yeah. is, you know, that it, it's, it's not just this to you, if I'm understanding your view, it's not just an alternate mechanism to put money in the hands of the poor. It's actually, it, it erases the stigma of being reliant and it provides all sorts of meaning that isn't available but simply by sitting at home and watching TV all day. Yeah, exactly. You provide things that our communities need and the work will be meaningful. You know what? I am not convinced about ultimate philosophical foundations. I think I am convinced by a guaranteed job. I think I was sort of somewhat unthinkingly in the basic income category. And I think having read your work and talked to you now, yeah. I think I am a convert on a federal jobs guarantee. Okay, well, great. I think it's catching up. But you know why I think it'll work? Is I think it makes sense in the context of American mores and in the context of American ideology and a, a sort of American predisposition towards hard work and self-reliance that, that can go wrong and can be used to justify all sorts of levels of inequality. But I just don't see middle America being inspired by the idea of we'll be just like Sweden. I well, don't see them being inspired by that. And it almost pays for itself because you can do away with all the welfare programs that the jobless need. It will, it will also, in many respects, reduce our mass incarceration. It will reduce the opioid epidemic and all yes, that. Yes, because it imagine, if, services that have value. imagine if when you're coming out of prison, you know that you're guaranteed a 20 an hour job. What's that exactly. going to do to reoffender rates? Exactly. And for the young people, there's talk in the United States of the school to prison pipeline. Yes. Particularly among minority youth. We can and shut it down. If you look at, even though many American liberals seem to regard like European liberal countries as like some sort of utopia, many of these countries yes. have youth unemployment rates of like 40 to 50 percent. Okay. Like terrifying. And if you think about what that means in terms of meaning in their lives, whatever, that's just a horrible state of affairs. Okay, final question. Um, if people, if anyone is in your district listening to this and they want to support you in the primary, what do they need to do? Is it too late for them to register? You have until April 24th to register. Voting begins 
early voting April 30th, the primary May 22nd. They can go to my campaign website, wingfieldforcongress.com. Mm-hmm. That's all spelled out, W-I-N-F-I-E-L-D-F-O-R, congress.com. And if they want to volunteer, they can sign up on the website. They can also contribute on the website. I'll, I'll link to all of that on my website when I put your page up. So April 24th is the deadline they've got. How are you feeling? Are you, um, I've worked with a lot of politicians. Have you enjoyed the process? Has it been tiring, stressful? Are you feeling optimistic, pessimistic? Where are you at? I, I'm generally optimistic. Much of it is exhilarating. Yeah. Because I'm going out to places I would have never visited, meeting people I would have never been seeing. Is and, this the uh, first time you've run for office? Yes, yes. Other than philosophical offices. <laughs> I was elected president of the free world of pure reason mm-hmm. when I was elected president of the Metaphysical Society of America, of the Hegel Society of America, also of the Society for Systematic Philosophy, but never for a public office like this. But uh, the one thing I do not enjoy is having to spend a lot of time calling people up for money, and that reflects our failure to have campaign finance reform. If you become a congressman, I've heard a statistic that about 75% of your time will be spent making fundraising calls. I will try to avoid that. I will try to avoid that if I can. As well as eliminate the conditions that make it imperative for many. You're, um, you're in good company on this show because we've interviewed Zephyr Teachow, who's a Fordham Law professor who ran for governor on a very liberal platform in New York. And we interviewed uh, Rupert Reed, who's a Wittgenstein scholar, um, who's been a Green Party politician in the UK for some time now. So philosophers running for public office. I genuinely wish you the best with all of that. Well, thank you. And th- thanks for giving me this opportunity to, to speak about these issues. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I've been having a an amazing time doing these interviews, and we have some really, really great conversations coming up. Rather than make the episode too long, I'm going to do announcements on who's coming up on the show on social media. So if you do want to get that, follow us on either Facebook or Twitter. And the links to both of those are on our website, politicalphilosophypodcast.com, politicalphilosophypodcast.com. And we have some really cool guests coming on in the next few weeks. If you're enjoying the show and want to help us get these conversations out there to the world, there's two ways you can do that. You can share your favorite episodes on your own social media, or... One thing some people have started doing, which is cool, is if there's an episode, if you're a philosopher or you're a philosophy student, and you know someone who might be interested by the topic of a particular episode, tag them in it or forward it to them, and that'll hopefully help us get these conversations to the largest possible audience. And a big thank you to those of you who've already done that. We have new content coming out every Saturday. Really great conversation, so make sure you like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff you can do on the interwebs. And thank you for listening. <laughs>